Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama, your host for another great conversation for business in Hawaii, a series that delves into issues, problems, and hopefully successes by small, medium, big business in Hawaii trying to really bring products that are high quality services and to succeed in this economy. Today we have a guest, Andrew Daisuke Stewart, the Showa Law Office in Honolulu. And I chose him today to really have a conversation about something in reverse. What I mean is that for several shows, I've been talking about exports from Hawaii to Japan. And there's many people who want to succeed in that business. Today, however, I want to talk about issues and challenges by Japanese investors in business in the Hawaii economy. And Andrew brings insights since he has a background in Japan. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Oh, thank you, Ray. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yoroshiku <laughs> onegaishimasu. So, uh, so your background in Japan. Uh, tell me about uh, your childhood and and uh, growing up in Japan. And where 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 did you grow up? Oh, uh, sure. So briefly, my dad's uh, originally from Tennessee. <laughs> my mother's uh, from Tokyo, and uh, so they met in France, and then they settled in Japan and. I was born there, uh, went to international school until I was about 11, and then spent two years uh, by myself in uh, Nashville, and then came back to Yokohama for high school. And then uh, after that, I graduated and went to university on the U.S. mainland. And then you came, uh, where did you go for law school? Uh, so I met my wife in college, she's a local girl, so we both uh, came uh, to Hawaii to uh, William S. Richardson School. Of law. So you you you've been in law and and um, you're uh, you're a sole practitioner. Uh, am I correct? Uh, right. I've been on my own for about six or seven years now. Yeah. And and show our law office. Uh, what's the background of that name? Of course, it it's, it's reflects the Showa Jedi or, or that reign of the emperor. But why Showa? Yeah, uh, people ask me that all the time. Well. So because of my uh, cultural and language background, uh, I'd say about 98% of my clients are from Japan or Japanese speaking. And uh, you know, Andrew Stewart doesn't sound very Japanese, so I needed to find a name for the office that you know, if somebody who's looking for a Japanese attorney could immediately see and recognize that you know, it has some kind of Japanese connection. And uh, I also happen to be born in the Showa era, and that's right. When the you know economy was good, that was the good old days in Japan, you know, before the bubble burst. So I think there's some uh, uh, emotional attachment people uh, from Japan uh, feel kind of sentimental about Showa. Okay, we, we use that term, <laughs> natsukashi or nostalgic right. about that golden age and uh, Japanese economy. So speaking of the Japanese economy and uh, Japanese interest in Hawaii, uh, one of the driving forces um, be, behind. Uh, nearly two million tourists in Hawaii, is that great affection uh, for Japanese um, that, that they bring to coming here for, uh, as tourists, as visitors. And then what happens at a certain point, uh, entrepreneurs want to open a business in Hawaii. And you, you must have met many, many of these uh, you know, very um, uh, creative uh, individuals from Japan. Is there a unique profile that you can tell me or the audience? What makes a person, a business person from Japan, uh, try, explore investing or opening a business in Hawaii? Sure. So my practice uh, consists, I'd say, about maybe 60% litigation and the remainder, you know, business formation or you know, labor issues, employment issues, uh, you know, assisting businesses uh, you know, purchasing another business, uh, leasing issues. So. Yeah, almost on a you know weekly basis, uh, you know I have contact with uh, Japanese entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs. Um, I guess there are probably several profiles. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, 
like you said, you know, Japanese people have a huge affection for Hawaii, and you know, they don't want to just come here a couple times a year. A lot of people want to, you know, have to stay here or retire here. Uh, and the big impediment, obviously, is uh, you know immigration status. Right, right. And uh, you know, one way around that, or a solution to that, is uh, the investment visa. Right. So I would say, you know, a great majority of uh, Japanese uh, entrepreneurs coming into Hawaii. Their primary goal is to get the visa, and oftentimes the business itself might be a secondary concern. Uh, on the other hand, there are also uh, you know larger you know companies that are, you know chain restaurants or stores that uh, you know want a, uh, a flagship store in Hawaii, right. and they open. So um, the E2 visa investors are usually smaller um, right. business owners, and then so. Uh, that's one type, and then there's the other where there may be public companies that you know want to uh, start in Hawaii. So th there, there's a there's a range. Yeah, there's a, yeah. well, you're right. Uh, it's a wide range right. because uh, I can just pick on um, my mother's um, uh, pre uh, island, of Hokkaido, and uh, there's at least four or five businesses like Kamofuji, uh, the tonkatsu place on Kapahulu. There's a brew, a Hokkaido brew, the bakery uh, with German roots, but through Hokkaido. The Santoka, uh, the uh, ramen place uh, at Don Quixote, and and um, uh, others, uh, uh, the Jimbo Udon on King Street. Uh, so uh, just uh, one uh, area of Hokkaido, there's uh, half a dozen uh, the smaller ones, and then you go to the extreme of Uniqlo, that's uh, opening their uh, store uh, first time in Hawaii after their flagship in New York, but they see a market in Hawaii. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I encountered you know various types of investors. Sometimes uh, you know it's uh, somebody still in their you know twenties who's been very successful, or sometimes it's uh, people who are nearing retirement, or it's sometimes it's people who have uh, young children who want to educate their yeah, well, children. Well, so, so here. You're, you're saying this is not one reason, but uh, it could be a combination, but the, the, drawn by Hawaii, attracted by Hawaii. The, the, the definition or the profile, uh, do they come all from Tokyo or do they come from uh, smaller cities or, or the countryside? Uh, where do they come from, the uh, investors? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I think maybe 10 years ago, Tokyo, Osaka right. uh, were the main, but yeah, these days I, I see uh, investors from relatively you know, regional cities like, like the Sendai uh, or, or Fukuoka, uh, Fukuoka Sendai, Hiroshima, yeah, uh, uh -huh. Kobe and so forth. Okay. Right. So, and and the, the uh, products or services, uh, you know, Hawaii is not going to be the, um, you know, a Google Software Development Center for uh, or Sony. Uh, they must come from some uh, retail or some restaurant or uh, a hospitality background. Am I correct? Uh, most of them uh, coming from the, those backgrounds? Uh, these days, yes. Yeah. And you know, as, as you probably well know, pre-bubble there were you know large corporations like uh, Kintetsu and Zebu. Right. They're right. mostly gone, um, and uh, so now they're um, yeah uh, smaller type. Uh, because historically, uh -huh. you're correct that. The major uh, inroad uh, by Japanese investors was, of course, the purchase of the Sheraton Waikiki right. and, and, uh, and Royal Hawaiian by Kyoya, uh, Osano Kenji, or Kenji Osano in the early 60s. And he was a pioneer. Wow, he looked at Hawaii 30 years in advance. And then comes the 80s, where you had companies, because of the appreciation of the yen, uh, suddenly companies that you never heard about, Azabu Jirosha, for example. But you're correct that in the past there were, for example, um, Mitsukoshi department store that right. came and left. Uh, there, uh, the, the, you can tell how old people are. They still refer to that as the Mitsukoshi building on the Kalakawa, the multi-colored uh, one. So there have been uh, a varied uh, investment, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, categories or uh, services and products coming in. But nowadays, it's more the entrepreneur uh, seeking, uh, you know, some kind of visa and, and trying to start up or some kind of uh, that they can put on their restaurant or shop back in Japan that they have a sten or a branch in Hawaii. All right. So these days, I yeah, the majority of the companies deal with are either restaurants, bars, or. Uh, hair salons, nail salons. And, and when they come to you from the get go, the, the first meeting, what do you tell them about Hawaii? I mean, uh, Hawaii, even for people from San Francisco, Seattle, uh, New York, LA, is 
a challenging place to do business in terms of taxes and labor laws, regulations, health insurance, uh, real estate, uh, electricity rates that are 32 cents a kilowatt hour compared to 11 to 9 cents on the mainland. There's a lot of barriers. What do they, you tell them? You know, in fact, I just met another prospective investor this morning, in fact, right. and uh, because of my litigation background, I tend to think sometimes of the worst case scenario, prepare Japanese investors for, you know, what could possibly happen, you know, things I've seen, you know, ending up in litigation, and my goal is to try to um, help them do their due diligence and their vetting uh, up front so they don't have to uh, confront, you know, litigation or other kinds of, uh, you know, regulatory or employment issues down the line. And uh, so some of the things I tell them uh, is that, uh, one, you know, you should be uh, wary of trusting people too much, uh, be only because uh, as a litigator, I I've seen a lot of investment scams uh, in Hawaii, unfortunately, targeting Japanese, and often the perpetrators are also Japanese. And uh, also, uh, I tell them, you know, that don't, don't use uh, Japanese common sense or social norms to, you know, apply to Hawaii, because uh, this is neither neither Japan nor it's not, it's part of the United States, but not exactly like the mainland. And uh, so, you know, they should uh, prepare themselves for things, you know, being different. And uh, if they don't, they can be in for a, a big surprise. A big surprise. Uh, uh, what percentage of these investors think of just Hawaii as Hawaii, having a business here, or thinking ahead as a bridge, uh, maybe the larger companies, mediums and larger co uh, size companies, maybe thinking of as a bridge to the mainland, uh, bigger markets like San Francisco, Bay Area, San Diego, LA, or Seattle. Are most people just uh, satisfied with uh, finding success in Hawaii, or are they thinking of finding success here that will uh, ultimately bring them to a bigger market? Uh, good question. Uh, you know, again, it varies, but I think uh, for s maybe, you know, roughly 20% of uh, investors, you know, th think maybe going into the U.S. mainland market, but uh, the f success or, you know, failure rate for businesses here from Japan is relatively high, so before they can get there, a lot of times they close down or they realize they just want to uh, stay in Hawaii. So it's pretty rare, actually, to see... Uh, uh, businesses from Japan come to Hawaii and then, you know, do well on the mainland, unless they're a really large company. Um, and then another issue is, you know, this is kind of a simple issue, but a lot of uh, people who come to Hawaii come to Hawaii specifically because it's uh, friendly in terms of uh, the language. You right. know? Um, they don't necessarily have to be fluent in English. But, you know, on the other side, on the other hand, that that's a significant impediment for them to do business in the on the mainland, because you know you don't have professionals who can help you who are bilingual, for example, and uh, you know employees maybe who speak some Japanese. So uh, I think, and I think Japanese are famous for studying uh, English in school for 12 years, but then when it comes to actually using it in a business environment, you know, uh, their uh, 12 years of uh, you know studying doesn't really uh, bear fruit. <laughs> yeah, it's strange that we are talking like this because you know, I, 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 we were talking about my 20 years in Japan. Mm -hmm. I was doing the reverse, reverse of trying to assist U.S. companies to uh, our, they're called gaishke, if you lump them all, uh, foreign companies in Japan, achieve success in the Jap Japanese market. And uh, many of the issues you mentioned about management, about uh, uh, services and products uh, geared or uh, fashion for the Japanese market, uh, regulations and so forth, are out there for American companies going to uh, Japan. And this is a mirror image of Japanese investors and businesses uh, coming to Hawaii. But in the next uh, second part of our show, I want to focus on how we can really bring best practices or due diligence aspects after this important break. みなさんこんにちは。ティンクテックハワイが日本語でお届けする。こんにちはハワイの日本語放送のコスト国末ゆかりです。各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情
Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Welcome back to Business in Hawaii with our guest, Andrew Daisuke Stewart of the Showa Law Office. And we've had a scintillating discussion on the issues and challenges of Japanese investors coming to Hawaii. And of course, this is a big topic. Uh, the ambassador from the United States to Japan, Mr. Haggerty, has been involved for many years attracting Japanese investment to Tennessee. And every state in the union is trying to bring what is called a reverse investment. A Toyota plant in Kentucky brings catered to companies uh, from every category to, uh, uh, as suppliers to their plant. And this, of course, boosts the local economy and, of course, creates new jobs uh, for the local population. So, of course, uh, for Hawaii, we must find ways to attract more capital, more business, uh, to really employ uh, more people in Hawaii. So this is a very important topic in the economy of Hawaii, how to make businesses succeed from, not only from Japan, from Korea, China, Taiwan, Singapore, and from the West Coast and Europe, or Brazil, in Hawaii, because that will, of course, boost the economy. But right now, we are focused on what can we say or discuss or list as topics so that Japanese companies can succeed better in the Hawaii economy. First of all, where can or how can these investors or business people, business leaders, before coming to Hawaii or when they're in Hawaii, get doing business in Hawaii 101? That's a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, what I've heard is, uh, I mean, there are obviously uh, Japanese uh, expat business community here in Hawaii. Right. and. You know, if you ask around, I'm sure people share their experiences. But at the same time, I've heard that you know, it's um, people can tend to be very protective of their niche. Very good point. Uh, yeah. Why you share your secret sauce or, or, right. or your secrets to success with some competitor that may arrive from uh, Kobe or uh, Sendai? <laughs> so, in a lot of it, it's just trial and error. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, there. I mean. I guess they could <laughs> watch your show. Well, but, uh, some of them, of yeah. course, go to local banks like uh, First right. Hawaiian and uh, CPB and Bank of Hawaii. All have Japanese-speaking uh, officers. Uh, they can help out. Also, uh, Japanese consulate may have some, you know, people that uh, who, who know about business in Hawaii. Uh, but you're right. It's 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 a it's a challenging one uh, because. Uh, in a very low employment economy that we have in Hawaii right now, which is quite uh, unusual because we've had uh, uh, recessions as, as uh, late as 2008, 2012. And now uh, we're doing quite well. We're running on all six cylinders in the Hawaii economy, and it's hard to get top people, qualified people, to run your business in Hawaii. Uh, but uh, these, uh, that employment area, of course, is uh, like a very high priority because you just can't stay here all the time. They, these investors or business uh, uh, people have to go back to Japan and kind of um, uh, ensure the success to somebody else. And what kind of people should they hire? Right. Well, you know, even before we're talking about employees, yeah. uh, I think it's crucial to have a team of, you know, an attorney, accountant, perhaps right. a realtor um, that you can trust and they work together. Um, so I, I think that's the first uh, step is to have a group of professionals that can advise them properly. And, uh, you know, not, not just kind of isolated issues, but try to get a professional who has an understanding of the bigger picture, and uh, they can uh, kind of give you comprehensive advice instead of just on a case-by-case -case basis, and they don't, you know, sometimes I see professionals not giving advice unless they're specifically asked, but, you know, since people coming from Japan, they really need to be taught from, you know, 
they have to know square one. what is the question, right. <laughs> one of the questions to ask. Yeah. You're absolutely right. They don't know the question to ask, then they don't have the answers. Right. <laughs> that's, the, that's, I think, a, a very good uh, area. You know, I've, I've worked with uh, investors uh, from Japan uh, locally, but you're correct that uh, w they, they need somebody on the ground and who knows whom they can trust. You're absolutely right on that. But also somebody that they would allow that person that they hire leeway to really run a business in the Hawaiian style. You know, employees in a, in a culture and to communicate in their language. I think that that's something that some Japanese investors want to micromanage or think it's the same as Japan how to treat employees or to run a business, and that will uh, invariably uh, snowball into consequences later. Yeah, that, that's a double-edged sword, because on one side, uh, it'd be great to have somebody here managing your business, but uh, it's really difficult to find somebody who basically to replace you as right. the owner. No, you're right. And yeah. on the other hand, um, you know, like you said, if you're here and you're the boss, uh, trying to run things the Japanese way, right. quote unquote, that's going to uh, make some employees very unhappy also. So it, it's a happy medium that you got to find. No, I think you're correct. And, and also, uh, there are areas of Japanese uh, service or products that are unique of high quality, and they don't want to lose that. And in, in America, it's a lot of times you encounter bad service, bad products. Mm -hmm. And you go to Japan and say, wow, this is, this is the uh, envy of the world in terms of uh, global standards. And uh, you, if you um, lower the standards, uh, again, uh, you may lose your customers. And so you're correct. There's a, uh, there's a happy middle that uh, somehow you, you can introduce top quality Japanese products or services in Hawaii uh, while uh, having a, a culture of employees who are really happy and doing their best. Correct, right. And the other thing, uh, kind of related to that, what I always tell uh, potential investors that uh, you know, don't go into your Hawaii business as sort of a hobby, or yeah. uh, you know, if you're going to do it, you should be committed. Um, because I see a lot of people just wanting the visa, and they hire a manager and basically, you know, assume they're going to run the business for them, and that almost always never works out. So they should be hands on. And, and again, back to your, uh, you know, your work in litigation, which is uh, tragic. <laughs> it's <laughs> something that I, I, nobody wants to see. But again, uh, they're coming from a culture where uh, real estate uh, deals are three pages long, <laughs> or barely. And here you have, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of pages covering every, you know, possibility that may happen or not. And the role of lawyers and uh, how real estate uh, um, agents are used, and and the quality of uh, you know uh, of uh, designers and construction in, uh, in Japan, are all different in in Hawaii. Right, and you know I don't want to talk too much about law, but uh, I think it's important because the Japanese legal system is right. so different. Um, you know, it's based on a continental, I think, German system. And although you know, there was a lot of U.S. input after the war, it's still, uh, you know, it's not a common law system. And uh, just, uh, you know, some basic uh, tenets of the law and concepts are just very different. And, you know, in Japan, it's still a uh, culture of uh, relationship and trust. I'd say the United States is a culture of, you know, duties and obligations according to whatever you know, agreement and I, you signed. No, no yeah. I think that, that's a, a big uh, um, a difference there on the role of contracts. Right. That in the United States, you have uh, so many people speaking so many different languages and cultures that the only way to ensure, you know, moving forward is a contract in English. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I've seen, uh, you know, in the last decade, uh, more than one occasion, Japanese people still you know, wiring or, you know, giving somebody a million dollars or more with nothing in writing, wow. you know, um, or having uh, entered into a transaction to buy uh, business with, you know, no professionals you know, advising them. And uh, it's almost always doesn't uh, <laughs> turn out very well. So, and I know a lot of uh, Japanese people want to, you know, they probably want to conserve uh, their, you know, uh, expenses. And because American lawyers are certainly expensive. But I think you know, spending that money up front can uh, uh, avoid a lot of headaches down the line. Another uh, big thing is to purchase uh, insurance and be uh, uh, well informed and have a good uh, insurance agent because things like you know if you get sued by your employees, that's something you don't even think about in right, Japan right, hardly. Right. But yeah. here it's very prevalent, and that doesn't come with your standard liability insurance. You have to get an extra 
you know, type of insurance or business interruption insurance. Um, so, and then, and I yeah. think you're right. The, the, I think the first thing is if they're new to business in America or in Hawaii, the role of a lawyer uh, mm -hmm. is quite different. And as you know, in, in Japan, um, there aren't that many. Right. <laughs> that uh, many times a contract is a basis for further negotiation mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than something set in stone. And so it, it is a very different world when they come here. But again, uh, if I ask the question, you know, two, three years, five years from now, do you see you know, no more of these uh, Japanese vessels coming to uh, Hawaii from Japan. The answer is they'll keep on coming. Am I correct? I hope so. <laughs> Although um, I was talking to uh, one client of mine who ran a successful business here and went back to Japan to take care of the elderly parents. Oh, right. And I think you and I talked about this off camera. You know, Japan has an aging population. Right. And, you know, he made a very good point that a lot of the tourists who come here, uh, they come with like three generations, and the grandparents kind of sponsor the trip, oh, right. and the uh, you know grandkids and the kids come. But right. now those that baby boomer generation, you know, they're getting ill or they're yeah. you know uh, can't move around or travel. So you know his point was that we shouldn't Hawaii shouldn't take Japanese uh, oh. visitors right. for granted, and that in the next five or ten years that those numbers can dramatically uh, drop. So uh, I'm definitely uh, you know on my toes and definitely not assuming it's going to continue. And uh, yeah, I, I think Hawaii needs to diversify. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. Japan's in uh, you know, a real transformation right now in many ways. So. Uh, we well, ironically, yeah. you know, it, it, uh, this year may be the best year in many, many years, mm -hmm. maybe uh, close to 2 million. It was 2.3 in 1998. Right. And ever since then, it's been up and down uh, from that time. Uh, but uh, you have a very good point uh, that uh, the savings rate among all the Japanese is, is the highest in the world. <laughs> but the economy uh, with the Tokyo Olympics is still moving ahead. And Japanese young people, you know, they're not interested in traveling yeah. or they don't have the money. So uh, I think now they travel domestically or maybe go to, you know, Korea Vietnam or Shanghai. Or, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Or so, nearby, yeah, uh, cheaper places. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you may be right, but uh, I think if we can uh, make Hawaii uh, a place where the investors and so forth can be successful, this will draw even more people here from Japan and continue the affection. Well, yeah. the other issue, I think, is the federal you know, rules and regulations about immigration or banking yeah. laws. It's you know, making it much more difficult to transfer money or right. even come into wow. the country without, you know. Well, that's a, yeah. I think that's a whole no another topic. And <laughs> right. we are at the end of another show business in Hawaii. Thank you so much, and thank you, Andrew, for your input and insights. This is Ray Tsuchiyama.